Now we continue in 1 Samuel chapter 10. Please turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 10. Now we have just read the scene of Saul's public anointing to be king. We have seen his private anointing in chapter 10, verse 1. Now this would be his um, public anointing before all Israel. And we saw something very, well, curious, all right? Very curious. He went into hiding. He went into hiding when it was time for him to come forth. Now, why would he do that? What's happening? What should we learn from all this? The title is Don't Hide. Don't Hide. Now, dear friends, there is one thing that we have been learning in the last message. And it is that God that God did everything that is necessary for Saul to succeed, for Saul to be the king that God wants him to be. God did not shortchange him. God was going to use him, well, to fulfill his plan of chastising Israel. But Saul did not sin against God. God was genuinely furnishing him with all the abilities all the, um, all the necessary skills to be a good king. God wanted him to succeed. Now, then we learned that that is so for each one of us. Now, if God wanted Saul to succeed in that situation, how much more would God not want you and I to succeed in our Christian life? Is it not true? Now, but the thing is this. If God wanted Saul to succeed, then why is it? Why is it? Now, we know Saul's life. We know what happened after this. Why is it that Saul would fail so miserably, horribly? What happened? Why, why does a Christian fail God? Now, the reality is this, Christian. God intends for all of us, when He saves us, He intends for all of you, every single one of us, to be successful in our Christian walk, to be successful in our service towards Him, without a single doubt. We saw how God bent over backwards, literally, all right? So to speak, to ensure that Saul have everything, furnished him with all. But yet, why did Saul succeed? Now, this is one thing that when I first became a Christian, I was worried about. Because over time, I, I saw Christians that I look up to, that I admire, that, that I always thought they are so holy, so godly, so, so used of God. Then over time, they fall into horrible sins. And then some of them, well, they leave church. They are no longer in church. And I was both puzzled and also petrified, very afraid. Will this happen to me? I had that concept that, well, you know, what, whatever is going to happen is going to happen. I, I have no control over it. I was fearful. Will this be me one day? And then when I well, entered into the Bible college, and I remember pastors that I, that I really looked up to, they were very successful, very mightily used of God. And then over time, they too fell. Now, why? Why is it? And when we begin to realize God wants us to succeed, and God will do, and will, or rather God will provide everything for us to succeed in our Christian walk, in our service, why is it that we will fail? Now, here is where we need to learn. Are you afraid, my friend, that in weeks to come, in years to come, you will fall into horrendous sins. You will commit terrible sins that, well, even if it's not exposed, 
it will cause great consequence in your life. Or you might get exposed and then you bring great shame, not only to yourself, your family, but to the Lord's name. Are you worried about that? How to prevent that? What must we be aware of? Now, then I have another question. Do you care? Do you care if you become useless to God? Because many Christians don't care. All they care about, Lord, I do not want to fall. Yes, please furnish me with all the abilities to live for you, to walk my personal Christian life, to make sure my family members do not fall into grievous sin and um, shameful things. And that they will grow up and be, their life will be fine and go through life fine. And myself too. We care about those things. But I want to ask you this question today. Do you care if you become useless to God? Because if you don't, this message will not mean much to you. Christians, I hope we understand one thing. Every single gift that God gives unto you and I, just like he gave to Saul, are all for only one purpose, to be used for him and to be useful to him. That is all. So young person, I hope you understand that. God gave an elderly and everyone, God gave the abilities to Saul and he, he was amazing. We saw, he was just someone who knew how to look for lost animals, looking after animals, wrong, wrong. Actually, he was not even good at that. He couldn't find the animals, right? Of course, it's God's intervention. He was not good at that. But then he will be someone, as we saw in chapter 11 briefly, he will be someone that could rally Israel together. He had leadership. Before that, it was his servant who tells him what to do. Hey, why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? Why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? It was his servant who has to lead him. But now, in chapter 11, you saw God gave him the leadership abilities. Not only did God give him the strategizing abilities, how to divide the troops, how to, how to uh, attack the enemies. God gave him amazing skills. Maybe you have amazing skills too. God gave it to you. Do you care that with all these skills and God don't use you? Because this is exactly what happened to Saul. Saul would have amazing abilities. Saul had, um, was given right, um, um, all the needs to th that is necessary to think as a king to rule Israel, to protect Israel. But yet with all that, God would not use him. Do you care? Adults, you have things in your life, you have skills, you have talents. Do you care if God does not use you? Now, most of us actually don't care. We don't care. God, as long as you give me gifts, I will use this for myself. I will use this to achieve what I want. I don't care if you don't use me. I don't care that when I grow old, I have all these things that have given me. I don't care if you don't use them. You don't use me. I don't care. Now, I want to use this as an introduction because everything hinges on do you care? If God doesn't use you and you meet him face to face and you have nothing at the Bema seat judgment to show that you love him and that you used, you were a steward. If you don't care, then everything else you're not going to care in this message. Because the bottom line of this message is this. Saul had everything to succeed, just like you and I. But what is it that happened in him that caused him to become useless to God. We will see. Very soon, God will already set him aside. God will tell him, you are done. So sad, you know. So quickly, we will see in the future weeks, so quickly, you are done. But he will continue, all right? He will continue to have the skills. He would still have that and he would do a lot of things. But he was done. Done with. Is that your life? My life? We continue and continue and continue, but as far as God is concerned, He has written us off. Do you care? Now, let us learn then, what was it in Saul? What were the telltale signs that you and I must watch in ourselves and say, I need to be careful? Now, the first one, well, we see the scene, right? He, 
when it's time to um, come out, all right, what did he do? He went into hiding. He went into hiding. Now, let us, let us see, all right? Uh, verse 22. Or maybe let's, let's see what happened. Now, first and foremost, um, look at verse, uh, chapter 10, verse 20. And when Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near, the tribe of Benjamin was taken. What does it mean? There was a drawing of lots, all right? They, they cast lots or some form of lot um, um, identification, and then Benjamin was taken, all right? So this tribe was, was identified out of the lots. When he had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the family of Matri was taken. So now it narrows further. The lot takes it to the lot, L-O-T, takes it to the, the, the next step. It was the family of Matri within Benjamin. And Saul, the son of Kish, was taken. Huh. You see, God narrowed it down, 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 down to this point. Now, then it was Saul. And when they sought him, he could not be found. Well, this is, um, this is curious, verse 22. Therefore they inquired of the Lord further, if the man should yet come hither. And the Lord un answered, Behold, he hath hid himself among the stuff. The stuff. It's almost like a cynical statement from God. Look. Oh, look. He hid me behind the stuff. Now, what, the st what are the stuff? Now, this Israel was gathered before, so this, they, they would have, well, their, 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 maybe their wagons, um, their, their um, baggage and their things and all that they need to, to travel here, right, to meet Samuel because he gathered the people. So the traveling things and all that. Um, so now, so these things will probably be nearby, and they say, well, he's hiding behind the stuff. Now, why would Saul do that? This was one of the first things he did after being anointed privately as king of Israel. What is there for us to learn? Now, before I go there, I want to say something. This is one of the passages that is constantly attacked, attacked by Christians attacked by Christian professors, Bible college professors. What is the attack? They say, you know, this doesn't make sense. This passage is wrong. It should be removed. This is an error. It was added by people. It is, it is com contradicting. Why? Because in chapter 10, verse 1, Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head and kissed him and said, is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? Now you see, Saul, Samuel already did the anointing. Samuel was very clear, this is the man. And Samuel has been told personally by God, and he went to anoint Saul. Now, how is it possible that now, Samuel will go and cast lots? So he said, this is, this is wrong. You know, it's, contra it's contradicting. Samuel knew already. Why would Samuel still cast lot? You see, the thinking of Christians today are very sad. They, their first assumption is the Bible is wrong. They never question, is we don't understand and we are wrong. The simple reading, even you ask a child, they would say, well, it must be because Samuel wanted the people, because there are thousands before him now, Samuel wanted the people to know that it is definitely God who chose Saul, not Samuel who chose Saul. It's as simple as that. You see, the private confirmation of Saul was for Saul to know. But this is not enough. It, he was going to lead Israel as a nation. Israel must see very clearly God appointed this man. And through the lords, not Samuel's choice. Samuel can't turn out and say, all right, I've anointed this man already. Behold your king. He cannot. It's not that Samuel didn't know. Samuel was already very clear. But Samuel has to go through this. When Samuel was casting lot, he was not trying to manipulate. He already knew God will intervene. It's so clear. Now, my point is this, Christians. When you read the Bible, when you read other people saying all these things, even Christians, you must always have the presupposition. God is always true. God is always right. Have that attitude. Now, but that aside, I just want to make sure you understand this. It's heavily attacked, okay? Now, come back to this. Now, why would he hide? Why do you think so? Now, some people think that, well, um, Saul was a modest person, all right? A modest person. Means he was humble. Well, after all, in the beginning, he said, I, I, I am a Benjamite, you know, of the smallest tribe of Israel. See, he is a humble person. So, um, th so he, he was very shy to come forward. Wow, so many people, right? And he felt, oh, maybe I'm not worthy, that kind of thing. 
Well, some people say it's that. Well, some people um, believe that it is, well, um, he, he didn't want the job, all right? He didn't want the role. He, he's, he feels that this is too big a task for me, right? So he didn't want it. So he, he tried to avoid it. And he's hoping that after they cast lot and cast lot and cast lot, and then he don't come out, all right? Then they will cast lot further, and then someone else will, will, be, cho- will be chosen by God. Now, what do you think, all right? Now, when we read scriptures, it is difficult to run away from the fact that Saul was exhibiting false humility. You say, how do you know? Why not the other view? Now, for a simple fact, now let us look. Let us look. We go one by one, all right? We go one by one. Look at chapter 10, verse 13. Now, Paul has this problem in his life, and you and I have better watch this problem. Otherwise, we can have skills, but we will be useless. I hope you understand this message. Why we are studying this is not to comment about Paul, uh, Saul. We are trying to analyze what kind of problem is this and make sure I don't have it. Now, let's start with chapter 10. It, you already see a problem in his character. Now, look at verse, verse 13. And when he had made an end of prophesying, he came to a high place. And Saul un- uncle said unto him to, and to his servant, Whither went ye? And he said, to seek asses. And when we saw that they were nowhere, we came to Saul. And Saul's uncle said, Tell me, I pray thee, what Samuel said unto you. And Saul said unto his uncle, He told us plainly what, that the asses were found, but of the matter of the kingdom whereof Samuel spake, he told him not. We say, Pastor, what's the big deal about that? Now, very often, yeah, maybe this, well, Saul had to keep it secret because it's not time to reveal it yet, right? Sometimes it's like that. So sometimes in the company appointment, say, well, don't, don't tell anybody yet, all right? Your promotion is going to happen, but don't tell anybody yet. We will announce it publicly, all right? So you have to keep quiet, don't tell anybody. You know, it's just like that, right? No, it is not. So some people say, well, you see, he's, he's very humble. Now, look carefully. Did, is there any situation in here that tells us Saul was not supposed to tell anyone? Why did he withhold this information? What was his character problem? First, was Saul told to withhold? Was it supposed to be quiet? Absolutely not. Look at chapter 9. Look at chapter 9. Now, verse 22. And Samuel took Saul and his servant. Huh? It's not private. Not secret. The servant. And brought them into the parlor and made them sit in the chiefest place. And what? Among them that were bidden, which were about 30 persons. Well, was it supposed to be secret? No, it was very public. These were the first group of people to know. Now, if you want to keep something secret, the first thing you keep secret from is the servant, right? Maybe some important people, well, they can know, but the servant, the servant don't need to know. And, this, and, and he was set at the chiefest place. And not only that, look at chapter 9, now verse 24. Now, I say in the middle, all right? Now, he even reserved the most important portion of the meat. Keep that. It is for the most important guest. Keep that for him. And then when he said, what did he say? Look at verse 24 at the end. And I said, I have invited the people. Invited. Samuel never gave any impression to Saul it was supposed to be private at all. Public. Now, why would Saul's response, look at chapter 10, B, when God says, but, but, this is the adversative. But, the matter of the kingdom whereof Samuel spake, he told him not. Now, Saul's uncle pleaded. Now, this Saul's uncle is, look, you know, if you look at verse 14, all right? Look at verse 14. They say, I went to seek the sheep. And then verse, uh, verse, 20, verse 15. Now, he knew and then Saul's uncle said, tell me, I pray you, what Samuel said. Do you think the uncle is interested in, in this thing? Samuel was a prophet. People are always interested in what the prophets say. Something must have happened. What did he say? And God says, that thing he didn't want Samuel, uh, the uncle to know. Now, this is already the first signs of a character flaw. Character flaw is not a good word. 
particular sin in him, telling half-truths, hiding truths. It was so different from Samuel. When, when Samuel was asked, I pray thee, what did God say? Samuel faithfully says everything. You like to hear it, you don't like to hear it. You ask me what God says, you plead with me, I tell you everything. The uncle was pleading. It can't be pleading, where are the sheep, where are the sheep? He's pleading, what, what, what happened, what happened? Now from here on, you will see that will be his character. Or should I say that has always been his character. We will learn later. Every time he gets in trouble, he will tell half-truths. He will not tell the full truth. He will give excuses. He will rationalize. He will cover up. Saul's hiding, hiding, already began before he physically hid from the people. Now, why do you think he hid this? Have you met people like that? They try to keep something. They know something is going to be announced, all right? They know something is going to be announced. And then they keep it so that there is maximum impact when it's announced. You, you met that kind of people? This was Saul's character. Uncle, don't know yet, all right? And he, know, he knew already that he was going to be um, ordained publicly. This, was going to be hap this will happen in time. And he wanted to make sure, all right? He wanted to make sure. Now, actually, how, how do we know that he knew? Look at chapter, chapter 10, verse 8. And when thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I will come unto thee to offer burnt offerings and to, sac and to sacrifice sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days shalt thou tarry till I come and show thee what thou shalt do. He just said, been anointed, you're going to make king, you are going to do, go through all these amazing, stupendous signs that God will show you to confirm your call, and seven days later, I will tell you what to do already, all right? What is going to happen, how to prepare for the anointing, the public one. So he knew, but he don't want to say. So you hide. Now, are you a character that is like that? I would say the problem here is pride. Pride is very often, well, most of everything can be traced to pride. Pride. He wanted the uncle to be, well, surprised, well, pleasantly surprised. Well, to know, why is my nephew? Nephew! That didn't know it was you, right? Sometimes people get promoted, and then you say, oh, I didn't know it was you. Like, yeah, no. That kind of thing. But in your heart, you strategize to make it as impactful as possible by the time it gets announced. Isn't it like that? I want you to notice one thing. Now, look at chapter 10, verse 6. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and thou shalt be turned into another man. You will be turned into another man. Now, this another doesn't mean he is a change in terms of um, a different, um, different heart. Um, it's just another, another means there was another part that was given to him. The abilities were given to him. But that part of Saul, that was always Saul, it doesn't mean it's gone. Our salvation is the same. After we are saved, God gives us a new heart and we are turned into a new man. But that flesh, like the apostle said, the flesh is there. As long as we are on earth, we will struggle against that. Now, Christian, do you care if you are useless to God? If you care, then you must not hide. Not hide from who you really are. That old man that will still be there to, to tempt you. That you will give in to. Until the Christian stop hiding and start facing who we are. There is that part in us. Pride. False humility. Desiring attention. Wanting position for the purpose of, well, feeling important, popular. Is that in you? Well, I think pride is in, in all of us. If you say you're not proud, you're already proud. It's in all of us. What am I trying to say? Now, Christian, if we hide, if we hide from who we really are, 
We just want to ignore. Don't think about this. Or, or we hide in the sense of, we don't care. We carry on with using God's skills. We carry on with, with using God's things to do things. But actually, all the while, that part of us, we don't face it. We've been studying at prayer meeting, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are they that moan. It's that spirit of really facing our sins, facing who we are, and moan over it. But here, you notice that Saul, although he has received these things, he, was, he had another, another man, another set of abilities in him. He did not control the other part of himself. Could it be that he, he don't care? We don't know. Could it be that he's not aware that he need to? We don't know. But we do know as we read scriptures, we must be aware. Don't hide, my friends, from who you really are in your heart. Moan, search your heart, know who you are. And especially if you're not saved, are you saved? My friends, are you saved? You can hide. You can choose to ignore and just don't want to think and just keep going to church and keep doing things and just go on in that life. Well, the only one that will lose out is you. Don't ignore and just hide from all these things. I just don't want to hear like an, like an ostrich. Just hide your head in the sand. I don't want to think about this. I just don't want to th- avoid. I just want to avoid it. Am I safe? Am I not safe? I just don't want to think about this. Or as a Christian, likewise, we just we just don't think. Now, I want you to also notice one thing. Saul. Saul was given now new abilities to strategize. Saul was now given new abilities to, to, to plan and to do things, all right, which we saw briefly in chapter 11. Now, the point is this. When God gives us gifts and we, and we just use them without facing who we really are and watch the other person in us, what is going to happen is this. You are going to use what God gives you to strategize, to achieve what you want to maximize your own popularity, your own visibility. See, Saul made sure that there was impact to the uncle. Clever plan, right? Are we like that? Sometimes, well, we want to... We want to do something for God, we strategize. Well, you know, I, I won't talk about this until, uh, until, until so-and-so is present, until pastor is around, or until someone is around. Uh, then, then I bring, oh, you know, the other day, uh, I, I did this or did that kind of thing. We strategize for maximum impact. We use God's, God's um, skills to us. It's very sad that many of us are very good at how to promote ourselves instead of using those skills to promote God. You know, sometimes the newspapers, they say, you know, these thieves, these robbers, they are so, so, so intelligent. They are so creative. The kind of software they use, the kind of ideas they have in, in stealing, uh, in robbing. And then some, some people say, well, if only they use that, all right, for good purposes. Uh, that is us. That is us. What we have we use that to promote ourselves. Students, are you like that? God gave you intelligence. God gave you ability. And all you do is to use it to get as best results as possible. Best results are not evil. But you're always doing it so that you can position yourself. And then you say, oh, I thank God for giving me all A's. Right? And you do it at the time where it's most impactful and the person that you want to impress most. You do it then. Isn't it true? So, dear Christian, if you know that there is such a person in you and you don't deal with it and you hide and you just want to ignore it, that you're a fake person, it's just a matter of time that God will set you aside. It's just a matter of time that God will stop using you. It's very sad, dear friends, that in Christendom today, that people have many gifts. And please know this, 
If you turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7. Let's turn to Ephesians 4, 7, and 8. All right, let me read to you. Now, after salvation, God wants you to know this. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore, he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. And after that, you know the famous passages about how gifts are to be used for God's kingdom for others, right? But here, notice in Ephesians 4, 7, but unto every one of us, every single one, yes, as long as you are a safe person and you're sitting here, here, whatever age you are, God says to every one of us is given grace. Grace, gifts, according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Once you are saved, you are given gifts. Just like Saul, all right? I'm not talking about whether Saul was saved. I don't want to go there. Now, as long as God assigns him to do something, God will give him the abilities. When God saves you and I, when it comes to salvation, God intends to save us, to use us, to give us the privilege to serve him. That is why he will give you abilities. You say, what is the point? In churches, you will notice it always is the struggle of churches. Everyone, there are many people in church, everyone has great gifts because that is what God intended you, you, to, you to have it so that you can serve Him. But many have character problems that they would not face or do not want to change. God gave all of us gifts. But the sad thing is there are so few that God can use. That is the saddest thing. Which is why I ask you from the beginning, do you care? If you don't care, then this is a boring message. When is the, the message to tell me, to encourage me that God wants me to succeed in my business, in my health and everything? You don't care. Every one of us have gifts. Christian, you too. And you do you want to live a life that at the end of it, you may do a lot of things, but at the end of it, God says, everything is useless. I never used you. Never used you. This character flaw, which I want to say is sin, all right, is all in us. We all have our, our issues. Now, maybe I put it this way. It's almost like Saul has a dual personality. I am not talking about um, mental problems or mental health problems. I'm not talking about schizophrenia and all that. I'm not talking about a medical thing. But just like the Bible tells us, the Apostle Paul wanted to live the holy life. The new man wants to do that. And then there is the flesh. There is the flesh that he, he contends again, he fights again all the time. Paul did not hide from it. Paul faced it and said, Oh, wretched man that I am. He talked about that part of him. He faced it. That is why he was so useful. Because as long as we don't face it, we hide from it, we ignore it, no matter what gifts you have, and that is the saddest part, no matter what gifts you have, you will be useless. Now, I can't tell you how many people that I've met in the ministry, they are gifted with amazing abilities. Amazing abilities. But because of pride, because of agendas, because of a desire to be popular, because of a desire to draw people to themselves, because of a desire to be in position, because of a desire, whatever it is, the churches can't use them. So sad. And then the churches have a hole in the church which needs to be filled. And that person has exactly the kind of skills that, of course, God gave the person to fill that hole. But because they don't face who they really are and deal with it. The church, have, the church continues to, to, be, to be struggling. Very sad. If you don't hide, and that's the title, if you don't hide, but rather you face the fakeness in you or whatever it is, all right? It could be 
whatever, lust of the flesh, lust of the, the pride of life, whatever it is, as long as you don't face it, you won't deal with it. You don't deal with it, you continue to be, well, like Saul. I do, I do, I do, but always that part of him, he just ignores it and in fact, he gives in to it. He lets that part of him lead him in his actions and he lets that part of him to use the gifts that God gives him to do exactly what his flesh wants. Make this as impactful as possible. Second problem that you see now, it develops too. And that is the one we read. Now, lot after lot after lot, single down, single down, single down, single down, single down to exactly him. And he went into hiding. Now, what do you think, dear friends? What do you think? Do you think it is, do you think it is, um, he was modest? Do you think that, well, maybe at this point of time, um, he, well, he was, he, well, he's, he's thought about this and said, well, I, I think I don't want to be king. What do you think? Now, I want to draw your attention to a few things. First, now, so firstly, we know that this thing, there was no expectation to keep it quiet, all right? Um, but he, he withhold information. Now, then we come further. Well, before we go there, let me, friends, I ask you, are you someone who likes to hold, withhold information? All right? To wait until um, the time where it will be most praised and most um, magnified. If you are like that, face it, deal with it, all right? Now, we come to this. Was he modest? I'm, a strong view, I'm of a strong view that he wasn't. This was not humility. This was false humility. You say, how do you know? Well, look at verse, chapter 10, verse 8. And thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I will come unto thee to offer burnt offerings and, sacri and to sa sacrifice sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days shalt thou tarry till I come and show thee what thou shalt do. Notice this. Samuel say, you go to where? Gilgal, number one. Samuel says, when, and seven days later, I will tell you what will happen next, what you need to do. Let me ask you, where did the anointing take place. Look at chapter 10, verse 17. And Samuel called the people together unto the Lord to mispay, to mispay. Samuel told him to go to Gilgal. The anointing happened at mispay. Now, these are quite at, at extreme ends of Benjamin, right? Quite from, they're apart, not the same place. And Samuel told him, you go to Gilgal first, and I will tell you what you shall do. And then, later on, at the anointing at Mispeh, the lot is drawn. And that's where he hid. What you shall do. Now, this is very normal. I've anointed you privately. There will be the public anointing. I need to tell you where, when, and what you must do at that time. Right? Now, just like your boss say, well, you know, well, among the senior managers, we want you to know, and you're promoted, come in, interviewed you, and then they promoted you among the senior managers, you know, right? Nothing secret. The department, your department knows. But I say, you know, because this is, this is a general manager's role, all right? So it's general management across many departments. Those departments, we will organize one main thing, all right? So we will be doing it, all right, in the cafeteria, all right? And it will be on this day at this time. And on that at time, this is what's going to happen. We will, be we will be saying some things, doing some things, and then at this point, we will announce. And when we announce, all right, then you come forward. All right, when you come forward, we present you to the people and say, now all the departments know that this is your new general manager, all right? You will be told what to expect, what to do, where to turn up, and when you're there at that time, when we say this, you come out. So Saul knew all that. In Gilgal. Now, if he was, well, not wanting to do it, what would you do? What would you do? Number one, you would have rejected the first promotion. Well, he said, maybe later on he, he figured it's difficult. Maybe he decided not to. But let me ask you, Gilgal and Mispe are very different places, almost at the other end of one another. Would you, would, does it make sense for, I don't want to be king? And then he traveled. And for days of traveling, he has so many opportunities, 
to not go there. He went there. Do you think it's true humility? And not only that. Now, if you wanted to run away, you'd be like the asses, right? <laughs> run far away, not to be found. But he went there. Do you think it's true humility? He waited. He didn't want to know. He waited for it to be cast, and he knew that the Lord will, he must know. Why did God give this stupendous, unimaginable sign after sign which is so complex and fulfilled to perfect, to precision? He knows it's definitely him, and this won't go wrong. The Lord casting won't turn up any other way except it will be him. With all this knowledge, I believe with all my heart, he wanted to make it as impactful as possible. Let me appear very humble. Let me appear very unwilling. Don't want, I don't want, I don't want. And then when he's brought up, wow, you are the one. So humble, right? So, um, so unwilling, but, but that yet you will come out and serve us. I believe with all my heart that that was the case. Not only that, now let me ask you. So to him, there is no way, no way that it would, the Lord will not turn up to him. And when God has made it so clear, even he hide and hide and hide, it will still be him. Now would you do this? Would you do this? Do you think it's normal to, 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 to do you think you can accept this? So that promotion, right? Back to that promotion. So you are called to be the general manager and you're promoted and you know you're the one, there's no one else. And then they set the time the place and the exact thing that you need to do when your name is called. And you know your name will be called, for sure. Would you, all right, if you, are, if, you are, if you don't want the role, would you turn up to job that day, turn up to office that day, all right? Then not only that, now this stuff means they are, they are nearby, you know, because they, they moved there, right? Not too far away. So they just need to run the shot, this and get him. You would, would you turn up in the workplace, you probably take leave and go far away. Would you, all right, turn up at the workplace, but hide, right, say cafeteria, right? And then cafeteria, maybe a few blocks away, maybe a few rooms away, toilet. Would you go hide in the toilet? If you really don't want the job, you won't turn up. And plus, if you want to hide, you hide far away or maybe resign. But he hid where he could be accessed. I cannot think that this is humility. He had a problem in his heart. His hiding was hiding a far bigger, sinister problem. And that is all us. Christian, if you and I don't face and address whatever sin it is in your life, you can have all the skills that God gives to you. You are going to be useless. But I say, but I don't care. I want to use it for myself anyway. Well, then there's nothing I can say to you but check your salvation. Fakeness. Fakeness. We say things to impress people. We do things to, to maximize our visibility. We do things so that it's most impactful to us. You have all the gifts, no use. I, I use this example frequently. It still continues to happen. People give love gifts. We always say, just, just drop it in the offering bag, all right? If you really want to give a love gift, you really love the person, you will still have people who bring it to the pastor. You know, pastor, this is for, for so-and-so. Hey, but don't tell anybody, all right? They support certain work and all that. Well, they, there are certain people they want, to, want them to know. Just like Saul, he want the uncle to know later on and get very impressed. In front of many people, he wanted to, well, walk in at the last minute, well, to have that, that, that fanfare, right? Might need to be invited out, invited out. Then look so humble. They cannot just write for what, work, for or for who, and drop it in the offering bag and let the church take care of it. They have to tell someone, Do you, are you like that, My dear friends? Now, I don't want to be overly um, presuming that, that you are conscious of it. My point in this message is this. Please be conscious. There is always that part in us. 
We want to ask someone, hey, you know this and that and this and that. But actually, we just want the person to know, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do this or that. That is all. I think just in our social media alone, our social media alone, we already know that. Sometimes you see some people's website, you get very frustrated. They're just showing off, right? But they will even put Christian verses and, and all that kind of things and have a Christian message. But the reality is they just want to show off. Show off that they are on this holiday, they can afford it, or show off that they did something and that kind of thing, right? Every time you post social media, ask yourself, are you genuine? Are you sincere? Don't hide from who you really are. Samuel and Saul failed the first character test. Will you tell the whole truth? No. So that I can maximize the impact on my people's view of me. He failed his first task. You say, what's his first task? Look at the last part. All right? Look at the last part. Well, they were very happy. They fetched him. Uh, then they presented him. And then they say, oh, God saved the king. Now you know where this verse comes from. This statement comes from, the Bible. God saved the king. Right? Now, then it moves down. Right? And Saul also went... Uh, where is it? Oh, verse, verse 27. But the children of Belial, children of Belial, learn that word, right? Useless. The children of Belial said, how shall this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no presents. Ah, another but. But he held his peace. But he held his peace. The other one, but he would not tell the whole truth. Now, but he held his peace. Now, what must we learn? Should this be a case where some people say, well, you know, see, this king, very kind, very loving, oh, so, so forgiving, right? Don't get offended, right? Do you think it's true? No, this was his very first task that he failed. You say, what do you mean? The children of Belial, now, at this anointing, they made it very public and clear. You can cast the Lord, the person is clearly chosen and it is him, but we despise him. Who is he to save us? We will not submit to him. We won't bring presents. We won't support him. But Saul held his peace. You see, isn't it good? No. You see, when, when we are concerned about what people think of us, when we are concerned about not offending people, because it's about us, that is a character problem. Saul has been told, look at chapter 10. Look at chapter 10. Right now I say, is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee captain over his inheritance? Saul was told very clearly, you are not king. God is king over this people. You are just a king that is serving this king of Israel. And you are supposed to do the bidding of this king. Your role is to defend this king. It is these people are is his inheritance. Saul was not supposed to keep quiet. He was tasked to serve Jehovah as king. When they, with all the clear sight of the Lord casting, narrow down to Saul, and yet the sons of Belial will openly say, who is this guy? Now it's open, huh? because at the next chapter, the next chapter, everyone knew that, right? Um, everyone, everyone knew that? that these people, well, they openly spoke against it. Now look at verse chapter 11, verse 12. And the people said, you know, after they won the people, won the battle, and the people said unto Samuel, Who is he that saith, Shall Saul reign over us? Bring the men that we may put them to death. You see, this was publicly known. Everybody who saw that, they heard. So probably at the anointing or at the Lord taking, they just shout, Who is this? Who is this? That kind of thing. People knew. Now instead of Dealing with these people, he just kept quiet. He should have taught Israel right from the beginning. If you reject what God appoints, and that was Israel's problem right from the beginning, and that's why they won the king. When you reject what God appoints, I will have to deal with you because I'm the earthly king that you can see. He was supposed to speak up. 
Now, Christian, when we have this kind of character flaw problem, it begins like that. We want people to think well of us. So we do things. We don't want to face the other fake person in us. We do things in a way that would, well, scheme and all that to make ourselves as prominent as possible. And when the time comes, when the task comes, and God gives you all the abilities, when God gives you the role, when the task comes, and then you will not do what you're supposed to do because you want to look good. You want to look like you're a very kind person. When people insult you and call you fat and ugly, fat, is it bad? I don't know. All right, me skinny, all right? You're skinny and ugly, all right? Whatever names they call you. When people call you and do whatever, when it's your name, by expectation, be forgiving, all right? Don't, don't hold grudges. But when he was appointed to do the pro, to, be, to be king to protect God's inheritance and God's name, and he keep quiet, do you see how very soon, with the abilities, will not, will use the abilities to promote himself, to make himself look good, don't want to face that, and eventually will not do what God intended him to do, what use is there? My friends, let us face, let us face our true self. While you go on in this life, like I said again and again, the saddest thing in church is to see many people gifted of God. Parents, your children are very gifted. Do you realize that? There's one thing that, that even unbelievers say, and unbelievers bring their children to church. You know why? Very often they say, church children are very clever. Church children are very intelligent, very capable. It is very true. I say it from experience. It is something unique. Do you know why? Because they are heritage of God. God intends them to be talented. God intends them to be successful in their Christian living. God intends to give them all the gifts because the church needs those gifts. But parents, what do you do with them? Let me ask you. What do you do with them? How much do they love God? And when they want to serve God, when they want to play the piano, when they want to serve God, it is pride. That is all. Train your child. Tell them, you have all these abilities. You use it to do well in school, to perform here, perform there, and let people stand up and applaud you. You use it for that. You will skip church to be there, to do that. What use are you to God? Not applaud them and say, wow, well done. You want so many accolades. You want to play the piano. Think of your own life. You are so proud, so stubborn, so, so rebellious. You think God will use you? You can win many accolades and awards outside, but you are useless to God. You will not use it for God. You will use it to bring attention to yourself. It's very sad, seriously. It's always the same group of people working. You think we don't want to have more people to, to serve? It's not that we don't want. We cannot. Should I do the wrong thing to appoint people that hide from, that ignores and won't change, continues in rebelliousness, in pride. God will expose you, for sure, all right? People always ask me, Pastor, when you preach messages like that, after that, people know what to do, you know. God is God. He will expose you. You will fail. The point is this, change. Don't hide. Face that fake person Face whatever sin you know it is in you. Don't just keep going on in your Christian walk and hide from that. May God help us. Let us rise to sing our closing hymn. Let us all rise to sing our closing hymn. 247. 247. 247. Let us rise. 247.